it's Tony from CassetteComeback.com and today I'm going to be looking at another rare cassette, another expensive cassette but also a pretty unique cassette. What is this? It's a Luxman cassette. Now Luxman come from the same group as Alpine, maybe you remember Alpine from their really good car stereos, Alpage uh, who basically with Luxman made some of the nicest looking and now some of the most sought after and expensive and functioning cassette decks. But the cassettes, like this one, pretty hard to find. Not common, but this cassette has something unique about it. In order to appreciate what it is that's unique about this cassette, I need to explain something to you that some of you may know, some of you may not. But here we go. So I'm going to be talking to you about azimuth. Now it might be a new term to some of you, you old hands will know what I'm talking about, so this really isn't going to tell you anything new. But what is the azimuth? Well, it's not unique to tape decks, as we can see here it's to do with, you know, measurements and angles and spherical coordinates and angular measurements and all that, but that's all very nice, but what's that actually got to do with cassette tape? Well, let's just look at how a cassette actually runs, right? We've got a head, and most heads are a two-channel head, you know, unless you've got an auto-reverse deck when it's a four-track head, or if you've got a four-track recorder like, say, a Tascam Porter Studio, but most decks are two-track heads. Don't comment if I've got left and right the wrong way around here. This is just to get the concept across. So you've got two heads, sorry, you've got two tracks, a left and a right. And on top of that, you've got the tape that covers all four tracks. But on the tape itself, the tape itself has four tracks. So we have two tracks, one going over the left, one going over the right in the head, and that's got the signal on it, yeah? And that's what's read as the tape passes over it, okay? Now, as you can see here, it all fits nicely. So we've got the whole of the head being covered by the tape, and each track going over each part of the head that it should be going over, giving it full signal. That's what we call a perfectly aligned azimuth. But here's the thing. Why would you adjust an azimuth? Well, the azimuth, i.e. the placement of the head in the deck is usually held there, and there's usually a couple of springs, and at the front of the head, there's some screws which adjust the spring. Now the thing is, over the years, these springs, the metal, they could be compressed, they could have got more compressed, or they could have got stretched, or someone's had a tinker with it anyway, or someone's dropped the deck and it's damaged how the head is held in place, you, you don't know. But what happens is, if these springs move, then the head and the actual left and right two tracks also move. And if we look here, if this is a bit over-exaggerated, but if they move enough, you can see that the signal isn't covering all of the headspace. So the actual heads are not reading all of the tape. They're missing part of the tape. It's not being fully done. And so this is why azimuths go out of alignment, and that can make the tape sound wrong, mostly dull. So this is why you need to adjust it. And this is what this Luxman cassette is actually all about because it says you can adjust this azimuth without having to actually adjust the position of the head in the deck. So there we go. I hope you understand a bit more about azimuth and what it is and why it makes a difference. So before I continue, these are rare cassettes and expensive cassettes this is the only one i've got so at this point i've got to give a shout out to a man that we all know a man called joel i.e dr bow aka the guy who owns oxide nation also known as the genuine cassette king of planet earth and it kills me to say that but i can't compete with joel and what he's got he's got a warehouse full of goodies that's just like all my christmases combined that uh, i never want to visit because after that life would just seem a bit more duller for me not being there. So, Joel, 
Thank you very much for sending this to me. He sent it me completely free of charge because he knew I wanted to do a video on this and I was struggling to get hold of one of these. So he sent it me. So, Joel, thank you very much. And if you're in North America, not Europe, if you're in Europe, you buy from me. But if you're in North America, bing, go and visit Joel's site because he's got pretty much every tape you could want. So thank you for sending me this, Joel. So let's have a look at this and let's see what makes this so special. I'll show you the back of this just because people like to see the backs of these. There we go. Yep. So here's what's special about this. Can you see it? We have here two little screws. One says record, one says play. And if you look at the angles, can you see there's like um, a little meter on it? Can you see this is in the middle now there and it's in the middle now there. So what this cassette actually allows you to do is you can adjust the play and the record azimuth. Now, it's hard to see, but down here underneath where the screws are, the little things that, that guides that move the tape up or down. So it adjusts how the tape goes over the tape head. So you're essentially adjusting the azimuth. And that's what the raison d'etre, the, the, the USP as we call it, the unique selling point of this cassette is. If we have a look at the actual little leaflet that comes in here, I'm not going to read it out, but I'm going to read certain bits for it. So before doing it, confirm that both the play and rec skew adjustment screws are set at the centre standard point. So like I've shown you there, that's where that little thing at the bottom, you can see it's in the middle. So basically, when you put this in playback skew, you put it in, you play the actual tape back and you move it until basically the way it works for me is let's just see, see, yeah, um, here we go. The level meter shows the largest swing. Select such a portion of playback problem that includes much amount of high frequencies. It is difficult to judge the effect of adjustment in the bass range. And that's it, yeah. If you're manually adjusting an azimuth, I mean, only do it if your tape deck does sound dull. If every tape you put in there is sounding dull, then what you got to lose? Yes, azimuths at factories are set, but after decades, them springs can compress, or some could have dropped the deck, or they could have twisted the azimuth themselves. You don't know where it is, and without a dedicated azimuth alignment cassette and a program on your PC or an oscilloscope, it's hard to get it back to IEC standard. But even then, who's to say that the tape that you're playing is at IEC standard? Hence stuff like NAAC on Nakamichi decks, which automatically adjusts the playback. And what they will do is playback azimuth. They'll look at the high frequencies and match it. I don't know if any of you out there have had a Commodore 64 or a Spectrum or an Amstrad and loaded games off tape, but azimuth adjustment was something big then. And we used to actually have programs for doing it. And what we used to do was, basically, on the tape deck there was a little hole that you could put a screwdriver in. And you'd load a program that would try and count up to, say, 8,000. And every time that it reset, it meant that it wasn't getting the signal it wanted. So you put the little screwdriver in and you'd turn it with an arrow attached to it until the, the actual program reset. And where it reset, you'd mark it. And then you'd turn it the other way until it reset again. And you'd mark it. And the middle point between them two is where the optimum azimuth is. And that makes sense to me. Where it goes dull there and dull there, the middle point is the optimum place. And you can do that on your tape deck. And now, like I say, you do it at your own risk and people will say, no, don't do this, no. But if your tape deck sounds rubbish and it sounds dull, because it's a trouble that you notice it with, put in a tape that you know, a pre-recorded one of a song that you know, and basically adjust the azimuth until it's, it goes from sounding nice and clear until it starts, do it slowly to sound dull. Mark it, do it the other way, it'll sound all nice and clear, and then at some point it'll start sounding dull again, mark it, and in between them two points is where the azimuth is. So this cassette here is designed for you to not have to do that. If someone sends you this cassette, you can adjust the actual cassette, it will move the tape up and down so that the tape itself 
has the right azimuth as opposed to doing with your deck. So why did this fail? Why didn't we see more of these? Why are these unique to Luxman? Couple of reasons. One, what if you can't get to these screws in your deck? You need to be able to adjust these screws while it's playing, unless you want to take it out, adjust, take it out, adjust, but then you'll never really be able to hear it happening. So you either now needed to do this in an open well deck, and as we know, there are far, far more not open well decks than there were open well decks. But more importantly, these were actually designed to be used in certain Luxman decks, which did have little holes in the doors, so that you could shove a screwdriver in and adjust the azimuth while it played. But, again, these are few and far between. So if you got a cassette deck which wasn't open well, and even if you took the door off like you do sometimes to clean the heads, you still couldn't get to these screws at the bottom, this cassette really wasn't a lot of use, unless you had to keep manually turning it and trying, but if you can't check it real time, it's no good. And certainly, even when it comes to, you know, the recording skew adjustment, which is a bit strange, I would have thought playback skew, if you can adjust the azimuth correctly while it's playing back, you know, why would you test the record skew? But anyway, but it says here, it can only be done on three head decks. I'll just let you have a look at this. I'm not going to read it out. Pause the video, have a read, if you want to read what it says here. But basically, unless you had a deck where you could access the screws, it was of little use to you. And I don't believe in the day these would have been cheap either, because there's extra engineering in this, and that's really nice. But does it actually work in practice? I don't know. Let's find out. I'm going to get myself an open well deck, and we're going to do some playback on this and see if the playback is actually affected by the azimuth. Okay, so I'm going to use my Dual 814 because I want an open well deck that I can uh, adjust a screw for this azimuth on. So here's the tape again, and if you can see, the play azimuth setting on this is in the middle. So, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to play a song I pre-recorded on the Jewel in this, and then I'm going to have a little tweak of the old azimuth, and let's see if we can actually hear any difference. Is this snake oil, or does this actually do something? Okay, right, there's a play azimuth. Let's play this bit of music, which I've chosen from the YouTube Royalty Free Library, simply because it's got a lot of uh, treble and hi-hat, so we can hear when and if the azimuth actually makes a difference when we change the screw. So let's have a play. Okay, let's just turn this azimuth. I'm going to turn it down. Clockwise. Right, can you hear that? That does actually sound duller. Listen for the hi hats. I'm now going to turn it back. Listen to them hi hats now. Still not sure. Let's turn it back. Ready? It's going, it's going, it's going. Look what it is now. Listen to them hi hats. The dull. Sounds muffled. Let's move it back. This is at the other extreme. It sounds better, but let's put it back to the centre where it was.
So there we go. That actually did make a difference. When I started turning it clockwise, you all heard it, it went duller. Put it back. It was fine. I mean, I've left this now in the center because I actually have aligned the azimuth in my decks. But this isn't snake oil. This actually did what it said on the tin. This worked, and this was useful. So why don't we see more of them? There's a lot of things in the audio world that I think are snake oil. I mean, there was a legendary producer, I've used this quote many times, called Joe Meek, and he said, if it sounds good, it is good. And I'm not one of them people that are constantly trying to get the ultimate performance out of an imperfect format, which is a cassette tape. I just want it to sound good. It's as simple as that. And there's a lot of things out there which is snake oil. I thought that this would be. It's not. It does actually do what it says on the tin. As you heard then, I adjusted it clockwise. I started to lose the top end of frequency range, i.e. you could hear then the hi-hats were going. I move it back and it sounded good. So this worked. This is actually a very good thing. I like this. So why didn't it catch on? Well, it's like many things. Let's look at the likes of DBX noise reduction. DBX noise reduction is brilliant, but it wasn't universal. And that's a problem. It doesn't matter how good something is. It just matters if people know how good it is and want to buy it. You know, we can look at loads of different things, you know, beta versus VHS versus Video 2000, different computer systems. It doesn't matter which is actually the best. What matters is which one wins the battle. And unfortunately, in this case, and in the case of DBX, it wasn't universal. It was specialised. And the problem with this was, if that every tape deck out there was open well, this would have made a difference. Not only that though, it would have made a difference if people actually understood what it did. Because these I'm sure sold at a premium. It's a Luxman cassette with a special shell. These were sold at a premium in the day. They certainly do now. So not many people who understood what it means by this skewing and bothered to go in depth and read this leaflet would actually understand what it did, let alone put it in an open well deck, break out the screwdrivers and have an experiment for themselves. They wouldn't have done this. So it wasn't adopted. That and the fact if you didn't have an open well deck, you're going to struggle to use this. Like I say, Luxman made special decks with holes in the glass doors so you could adjust it. So that's why this didn't take off. And that's a shame. But as far as cassettes for collecting goes, and like I say, I mean, collecting is one thing. I mean, I, I collect cassettes, but I don't collect, you know, stupid expensive stuff. You know, I, I wouldn't... I'll give you an example, right? I'll give you an example about me and collecting and selling, right? I got offered some cassettes. I won't mention what they are because the person will know who, who it is that offered it me. But I offered, got offered some cassettes. They were manufacturer brandy cassettes. And they're rare and they're expensive. And I got them for a price that was high, but I knew I could make money on them. But I didn't buy them because I knew underneath the flashy wrapper and the rare branding on the wrapper, that they were actually just an average Say Han rebrand. And as such, being a proper tape head, it's like, yeah, but there are unspectacular, pretty common cassettes underneath with a fancy wrapper on them. I can't pay that for them, and I can't sell them, whereas the collector will go, I do not have that in my collection. I cannot therefore take a full photograph of the collection and post it online to get loads of likes. I need that cassette. I don't care that it's a stupid amount of money. I mean, I've seen someone pay $450 for one Kenwood cassette, which is a TDK rebrand because it's a Kenwood. So what's that got to do with this? I think that these are expensive, but they are worth getting. Get one. It's a remarkable little thing, you heard it there, that you can adjust the azimuth in this and make it maximum azimuth on any deck. I think it's a brilliant idea that's well executed, easily executed, and genuinely makes for a unique tape. So yeah, it's probably going to cost you 70 quid for one of these, but if you are into, you know, not, not a hardcore collector that's just got to have everything 
you know, to fill that hole in your life. If you're just someone that loves cassettes and you like having a little collection of special cassettes, along with maybe your MARs, etc., these are worth getting. This is a cassette worth getting because it's not snake oil, it is unique, but it actually does something functional that I can hear. I couldn't hear anything better in a Sony Metal Master because it's got a ceramic shell. But here I could actually hear a difference. It did something unique. And that's why I really like these tapes. And I'm saying that as someone that doesn't sell these tapes. You know, but if you are getting a little collection together of unique special tapes, not just buying because you have to buy it because you don't have it, this is a very special cassette, really unique and well worth the money. So there we go. I hope that was useful for you. As always, please do like and subscribe. And until next time, happy taping. Bye-bye.